Hey everybody, Joseph Rothschild here, aka MBT, and welcome to another episode of Locals Live. You may have noticed this isn't Locals, it's my kitchen table. Uh, well, you're just going to have to deal with it again. Uh, while I got out to Locals a couple of weeks ago, I didn't have time to this weekend because myself and Simo will be commentating the PPT Columbus event. So if you're interested in hearing that, uh, we're probably starting at the same time that this is going up. Uh, just tab on over to twitch.tv slash ppgygo and you can hear us. In the meantime, here's myself playing my roommate. And of course, he has drawn Ash. Uh, we played a couple of these sets. This was the most interesting. And every single time he had the Ash. Blossom for the Extravagance, and I lacked the Called by the Grave. I'm playing Necroz, successfully migrating from Guru. I know some of you in the comments sounded off about how you actually did not hate seeing it all the time. Well, I hated playing it, and that's really all that matters at the end of the day. We're going to activate Incantation Pensaplume's effect. Of course, this summons an incantation from our deck, and then that card will likely add a ritual spell or a ritual monster from our deck to our hand. We've picked Talismandra, so we're going for a monster. We'll add Incantation Chalice Slime, who is critical to almost all of these combos. Just an incredible card, new piece of support for a ritual archetype, period, and slots very nicely into this good stuffy Necroz variant. Uh, the version I'm playing is not particularly Necroz heavy. We have three Brio and one of the good Necroz, alongside some pre-preparation of rights targets like the Shino Birds, um, Saphira in order to send Ben 10 and find Vanity's Ruler, and the like. Unfortunately, we've drawn none of that and are going to have to be content with a Unicorn this game. Our opponent's playing Thunder Dragon, as always. Very frustrating that this deck did not receive any hits on the ban list. I mean, it's probably not particularly meta-warping, but it certainly is frustrating for individuals trying to play fun decks that search 25 times a turn like I am. You can see in the center there we have a little woodcut of Cyber Dragon. I think it looks fantastic, um, and if you're interested in it, on my Twitter is a link to the individual who made them, who's currently having a sale. Any one of these is $10, so if you're interested in having a little Cyber Dragon or any card, perhaps a pacifist the Phantasm City of your own, uh, shoot them a link. So we're getting, uh, kind of deciding here. I think we're ending up with the Brianak, who we will, of course, send to the graveyard to get a Valkyris. Um, keeping Unicor on board for a turn is probably the best we're going to be able to do. Uh, but it's not great. <laughs> it's not particularly fantastic. Especially against a Thunder Dragon deck that's just so adept at, uh, pushing out so many interactive monsters. So you can see that my opponent has just drawn a trap card. This deck, of course, plays very few traps. I think the only one he's on is Paleozoic Dynamiscus, which is an incredible way of dealing with things like Vanity's Ruler and are likely to be a problem in the future. Unfortunately, they've opened a Lure plus Roar, ye old Thunder Dragon combo, which means they're going to be able to get a Dark from deck and pop off from there. <sighs> there it is. Thunder Dragon. It may not be exciting, but at least it's consistent. You can see they have a monster whose effect they can activate in hand if they need to get things started the hard way. That is a normal vanilla Thunder Dragon in the hand. What frustrates me the most about Thunder Dragon is that even though they printed like 15 cards with all this ridiculous text on them, sometimes the best of the Thunder Dragons is the OG. Just mulling about their hand real quickly, deciding what they want to do with their turn. They're going to take a quick look at what we have in the graveyard, of course. Uh, this deck effectively plays with the graveyard as a second hand, with the ability to banish Necroz spells in order to get additional ones to hand, uh, the ability to ritual summon from the graveyard using stuff uh, like Necroz Cycle, and the ability to use the monsters in the graveyard as material with spells like Necroz Mirror. Additionally, any of the incantation ritual spells in the graveyard represents an enormous pop-off that we'll be lucky to see over the course of the game. It's kind of difficult, even when playing a deck as linear as Thunder Dragon, to navigate plays on a board state this interesting. I'm looking at the deck real quickly, and thumbing a couple of cards in hand before deciding to, yes, go for Green Thunder Dragon. So, since this is an activation of a Thunder Dragon in the hand, now Colossus is online. All he'll require at this point in time is the tribute of one measly Thunder Dragon monster. Ugh, there's another Ash in the hand. Are you kidding me? It looks like he's going to tribute summon a Thunder Dragon here. Well, sometimes you do what you have to. It's not that big of a deal. It allows him to search a Hawk, uh, which means that 
both a monster has been activated in the hand, and he'll have access to enough monsters uh, to make the complete Thunder Dragon combo. Searching Hawk at this point in the combo makes me feel as if he either has access to a Thunder Dragon fusion or a Thunder Dragon duo, uh, which completes the combo in a different way. So the next thing he's going to do, of course, is link away to... Ugh, Some Summer Summoner, a card specifically designed to screw me up in long-form audio recording. Afterwards, ooh, there's a Thunder Dragon fusion in hand. Uh, he will activate the effect of Hawk in order to bring back... Oh, I think you probably bring back normal Thunder Dragon right here just because it's the funniest target. Yeah, it looks like that's what he's doing. And Thunder Dragon fusing uh, the remainder of his... Uh, graveyard and banished zone away. Um, thinking real quickly about what he wants to get rid of, uh, there probably is a right and wrong answer to this, but it matters so little that I don't think uh, it's worth agonizing over. He's going to shuffle these three back into the deck, uh, pass it back to me, just kind of sitting on my hands right now, hoping for some way to interact or at least uh, beat a board of several Colossus next turn. Of course, Necros does have multiple ways to do so. There's, of course, Brianak, whose on-board ability you may have forgotten about, but it shuffles monsters from the extra deck uh, back. Additionally, you know, Unicor is pretty good at stopping things that exist on board to ruin my day. And Trishula is... fine. Trishula is in a particularly weird position against decks like this, because... Every single part of her effect is mandatory, and while your opponent will usually have a uh, not particularly offensive target to remove in the graveyard, banishing a card from the hand against Thunder Dragon is quite horrifying. It looks like our opponent is just going to fi finish the execution of his combo at this point, uh, going into a couple of Thunder Dragons so he can eat my entire board, and then uh, finishing off the remainder of my monsters. Now, thankfully, it doesn't look like we're liable to lose absolutely everything here. Um, take a quick look at the hand, uh, gonna check Ash Blossom and see if there's some sort of interaction he's missing. He's going to go attack the Unicorn, and of course we added the Valkyris to hand, um, for this exact reason. Uh, we'll go ahead and send it to the graveyard, banishing a Necroz card from our graveyard in the process and ending the battle phase. Our opponent's gonna take a quick look at this. I don't blame you, dude. It's been a while since Necroz were anything resembling meta, so not knowing the effect of something like Valkyris is probably forgivable. It'd be nice if we could also have found room for a Gungnir, but it doesn't particularly matter when the Thunder Dragon Titan isn't able to pop while Unicor is on the field. Now, unfortunately, we need something right about now. Um, we basically need to be able to find exactly the Shinobi. And this is why we're playing extremely powerful searchers like Pre-Preparation of Rites. On the play, it allows us to go for something like uh, Sephira and Cyber Angel Ben 10 in order to find a Vanity's Ruler. But on the draw, it allows us to find the entirety of the Shinobi. Uh, that is Shinobaron Peacock or Shinobaroness Peacock and their ritual spell, which names them both. This allows us to shuffle either monsters from our opponent's field or back row from our opponent's spell and trap card zone back into the deck, at which point we can usually special summon an Amano Iwaho, who is incredibly powerful in this metagame, and most metagames where you can stick him on field for the entirety of time. So the first thing we're going to do is activate Chalice Slime's effect in order to get a Talismandra, and oh, an Ash Blossom, are you kidding me? Uh, we had this locked up, but Ash Blossom really, really screws things up. Ugh, without the ability to add a monster to our hand, I don't exactly know what we're going to do. Uh, sometimes your opponent just draws them both. <laughs> Imagine drawing two Ash Blossom in a hand that can make so many Thunder Dragon Colossus, and then finding a use for them anyway. Sheesh. Talk about Nambos working out. So we're going to switch our copy of Unicorn to defense position and dare our opponent to do anything. They're of course going to. You can imagine that they have several different things they could do this turn. The least frightening of which is just attack, which still wipes the entirety of our board and leaves a couple of colossi we have to deal with. This ranks above the most frightening things they could be doing. Uh, gold sarking away a copy of Dragon Roar so they can pop off. Now, thankfully, they don't have much left to pop off with. They'll go ahead and special summon a Dark from deck, but it's not like they really want to even perform a Link Summon with this many critical monsters on board. I think they're just going to use it to attack. They're going to look real quickly through the monsters they have available. There's, like, a Hawk, uh, a Matrix, potentially. I think most of them are going to pale in comparison to Dark. And yeah, he's going to eventually settle on Dark, special summoning it in attack position so that it can eat over one of these unfortunately statted 
incantations. On one hand, I want the incantations to, like, have attack and defense points. But on the other hand, having them at zero means that stuff as weak as Link Haribo can walk over them and clear the board for way of, like, super polymerization uh, or any of the Necroz spells in Graveyard. And opponents almost always clear the board uh, just because it's so satisfying to do so. And of course, now that all of his monsters are on, he can now pop one of my incantations if he so desires. Thinking real quickly, and it looks like he does so desire. He's going to activate the Hand Effect of Dark to get the third Dark from his deck to his hand, which will pop one of the incantations. Now we can clear the entire board, leaving us with a measly Chalice Lime plus one additional card in the grip. It's going to have to be something amazing. He'll go ahead and walk over the Pensaplume, not long for this world, alongside the two copies of Tala's Mandra. Okay. We get into a little tizzy right here because he doesn't remember attacking with the Colossus. I promise you have. I am still at a healthy 5,500 points of life. Remember, any time you activate the effect of Incantation Chalice Line but fail to perform a Ritual Summon by the end of the turn, you take 2,500 points of damage. This deck is really, really good at just accidentally killing itself. What with cards like Gale Dagra, Extra Foolish Burial, and Incantation Chalice Slime you end up doming yourself for a ton a lot. That's why it's so important to play cards like Valkyris that protect your life total. We're going to draw for turn. Ugh, it's not good. I don't like to usually project non-verbals, but boy, I am looking really depressed. Uh, good thing that I could not show my face on camera, uh, because boy, that would look upsetting. So now that these Colossi are on, I'm going to have to figure out something particularly spicy to get with this Chalice Lime. And I think what I end up settling on is a Pensaplume to add back the Valkyris. Oh, okay, it's not exactly as spicy as I would have desired, but it does keep me alive for another turn. Uh, because I can't search anything, I'm not able to find my way into the Shino Bird stuff, so I kind of have to rely on drawing it. Now, this isn't a 40 card deck, uh, we're playing a tight 50 which means that it's very unlikely I do so. So much of my deck is things that are able to find the Shino Birds, you know, uh, Extra Foolish Burials, uh, Kaleidoscopes Sending a Herald, Gale Dogra, the Incantations, and now we're completely off. Uh, my opponent's going through the motions here. While they can do a fair amount of interesting stuff, uh, basically all of it pales in comparison to getting the Valkyrus out of my hand and waiting. They're going to go ahead and Tribute Summon <laughs> for a Dimension Shifter. Eh, you do what you gotta do sometimes. That still does trigger the effect of Dark. and allows him to get a Thunder Dragon to hand. That Thunder Dragon represents potentially two pops. Uh, but of course, I think he's only going to need one. Dang. Imagine wasting this much on a Pensaplume. Please, sir, have mercy. Alright, he's gonna go ahead and add another Thunder Dragon to hand before moving to combat and allowing me to Valk accordingly. You'll notice that our life points are getting precariously low. We are now so low we can't even manage a measly Gale Dogra activation. Disgusting. For only five life points, you too can ensure that I pick up game two against Thunder Dragon. Uh, so he'll go to combat, I'll Valkyris, and he'll say, well, <laughs> good luck to you. Buddy, you gotta find something interesting takes a quick look through the graveyard and remembers there's a Thunder Dragon Fusion, so we'll go ahead and activate that too, in order to search a monster that he can activate at quick speed off Titan. Good. Annoying. So, unbeknownst to my opponent, I do still have an out. I wouldn't have stayed in this game for so long unless there was a way I could make this happen. Uh, step one is drawing Pot of Extravagance, and after finding two Ash Blossoms, my opponent sighs and says, yeah, okay, you can have exactly two monsters in your extra deck. I'm not too beat up about it. One, two, uh, three, <laughs> four, five, six. It's always worth it if you are on the opposing end of an Extravagance to take as long as possible and be as annoying as possible with the cards that you exile from the extra deck. Um, one of the rare joys in life. So we draw a couple of cards... And remember, I have a Brianak in Graveyard. So a Necroz Cycle bringing back the Brianak allows me to spin both of these Thunder Dragon Colossuses. Now, if I'm able to do that, I might have a fighting chance at this game just by virtue of searching enough stuff to find my way to the Shino Barons, which will clean up the remainder. However, that's a big if. 
The important part here is that I need to find a way to make six stars worth of tribute material. Now I'll reveal to you right now I have hard drawn into the cycle. The last thing I need is a monster with enough stars. We're going to activate Chalice Slime in order to get ourselves a copy of Candall. That's four. And we have a Gale Dogra in hand. So if they allow this cycle to resolve, I will be sitting on a Bryanac. And of course they can destroy it with their copy of uh, Thunder Dragon Titan. But let's not think about that right now. They are going to activate the Matrix, destroying my copy of Candall by using Thunder Dragon Titan's effect, and yeah, that will do it. Now, I do have a Chalice Slime in my hand, so I'll have to check real quick to see if, well, 7 plus 2 is 9. Maybe there's a Trishula in the graveyard that I forgot about. Of course, there isn't. And I'm going to take a quick second and say, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I think that extremely weird action, destroying a monster who has no attack and has no effects on board, does win you the game. So we're now in game two, and let's get things poppin'. Gale Dogra hits the field. We'll activate the effect to send a copy of Herald of the Arclight from our deck to the graveyard, which... Oh, come on! Oh... Okay... Oh my goodness, I don't know if you can hear it on the recording, but my roommate is giggling like a maniac. Well, Harold and Ntis require themselves to be sent from the extra to the graveyard, so we're going to send our 12 target for Kaleidoscope. We play three of them because we're on extravagance. So losing one isn't that big of a deal, but I paid 3,000 life points for this? We're next going to activate Pensaplume. That'll special it, and we'll go ahead and grab a Talismantra from our deck. Our opponent's going to read it real quickly to see if it's something he can Veiler, and no, you want to Veiler the second monster that I get out. It's much more impactful. We're going to shuffle through our deck real quickly in order to find it. And remember, it's a 50-card deck, so the three minutes I take to find any individual target isn't slow play. It's justified. Having a little discussion real quickly of when and where you're allowed to negate this card. Not particularly often, it turns out. The incantations are very good at protecting themselves. We'll then use the effect of Talismandra, and our opponent will send an effect veiler from the hand to the graveyard... Oh no, sir. It's time for you to read your own cards. Dimension Shifter may have lost me 3,000 life points for nothing, but it prevented exactly one Effect Veiler from you, too. Take that, liberals. We're going to get to add one monster from our deck to our hand, but, uh, <laughs> while Unicorn might be particularly strong when it's backed up by, like, a Valkyris, it's not particularly strong... When you're sitting on a Gale Dogra and about eight remaining life points, you've got to be able to stop your opponent's battle phase or else you are not long for this world. We're going to look through the deck one more time. It can be hard to decide, especially after getting Unicorn and losing so badly in the last game, what exactly you want the searched target to be. I mean, we could get Unicorn, but we have no way to beat the actual body of uh, uh, Thunder Dragons, so we might have to decide on something else, maybe setting up a Trishula for next turn. But even if we do that, there's almost no way we survive with an attack position Gale Dogger clogging up our board. Ugh, I hate how difficult this is. Alright, we're, we're gonna... Uh, I don't know. Oh, this is too hard... While I really like this deck, one of the many difficulties that it presents is at all times you're effectively playing with all 50 of your cards fanned out in front of you, and you can easily get overwhelmed by choice paralysis, especially when the cards do such disparate things that going onto one particular line over another might accidentally just lose you the entire match. We're in that position right now, as losing the match has never seemed so imminent before. Still thumbing through the deck, I mean, it's not like a... Any of the Shino birds would do anything. The other line that I'd like to go on, game one, is the Sephira one, but it requires so many searches that a Talismandra is unlikely to yield, and Unicor is just so weak. Ugh. 
At the very least, Unicor allows us to potentially Kaleido, uh, but Kaleido is so much worse on a board where we don't have access to any of the graveyard effects that would make it powerful. Sending a Herald, for example, is not very good when you're both under Shifter. Oh, shoot. This is a thinker. So I might be defaulting onto the Trinity line here, which is where you go into Valkyris and then use his actual onboard effect to send a couple of copies of your incantations, not necessarily to the graveyard, but off the field to draw an equal number of cards. Of course, drawing cards isn't particularly good. It gets us, what, an Ash Blossom? Potentially, uh, but nothing else. I'm thinking about Unicor right now, but I don't know how good it is. After all, it's really only a powerful card if you're able to follow it up with Valk, and even though we have access to Valk via the many searchers that still remain in our hand, we don't have the ability to banish a Necroz card from our graveyard if I'm going to spend an entire turn under Shifter. Ugh. These lines can be so difficult, and all off of one individual card from our opponent. If you're ever playing against this deck in real life, don't hesitate to call a judge for a slow play, because what I'm doing here is certainly not legal. Okay, we're going to go ahead and shuffle it back to get a copy of Valk. Ugh, it's not great. I think about maybe going into Bryo first, but what? So I could send Bryo to the Banished Zone as well? Doesn't seem very strong. My opponent's going to read Valkyris to ascertain what its on-field effect is, expecting us to summon it immediately afterwards. Yes, I will be doing that, and no, it's not going to be particularly good. Next, I'm going to discard a card, so we can go ahead and use the effect of Chalice Slime in hand. If there's one thing that's always a small comfort, it's the Chalice Slime is on almost every single one of your openers. Uh, this thing is a house, and he's almost always searchable by one of the incantations, or something like a Preparation of Rites, and just unlocks so many potential combos. Here we're using him to get a copy of Candall. Now, unfortunately, we're going to have to hard ritual summon this Valkyris. It's an 8, and of course, the Necroz rituals require you to have exactly the correct number in terms of stat line for rituals. We'll get a cycle. Of course, I might want to use Mirror over the course of the game, and Kaleidoscope is not very good under Shifter. A cycle seems like the least offensive, and we can easily send a copy of Gale Dagra and a copy of Talismandra off of our side of the field to the graveyard in order to special a Valkyris from hand, after which we can get rid of these last two incantations to draw a couple of cards and potentially find some action for next turn. I'll do just that. Thank God we're not going to die to an attack on Dagra. That would be particularly offensive. And my opponent's going to look real quick at how cycle works. Yeah, we can activate it under these conditions, but it's not pretty regardless. Drawing a couple of cards here isn't bad, but effectively we've churned through a significant amount of our deck's ability to pop off uh, just to end up with a four-card hand and one guy on board who does absolutely nothing. It's going to read Valkyris real quick. No, it's just a big, dumb, silly vanilla. Boy, it'd be great to affect Valor, though. Shame we're under Shifter. And after I summon him, I'll draw a couple of cards and pass it back to my opponent. This shouldn't be a particularly hard turn for my opponent. Turns under Shifter rarely are, but we'll see what they end up with. Now, notably, getting those incantations off my side of the board does one additional thing I haven't mentioned. While it's good for drawing cards and clearing the board of chaff and activating the graveyard effects of your Necroz spells, which of course won't factor into this game, it's also very good at clearing the way for a super polymerization, which we have set. If you heard the small moan come out of my mouth there, it's because my opponent has normal summoned... Ah, <sighs> Battery Man Solar. This is the payoff for playing Shifter. The ability to normal summon Solar and have it send a copy of Roar to the Banished Zone like it were a copy of Allure of Darkness is just unmatched. Do you hear that? Oh my god, it's right outside my house. They found me! The slow play police! I'm kidding, of course. I'm just living in a particularly busy neighborhood. Our opponent's going to look at Valkyris one more time, making sure that there's absolutely nothing remaining on this card that could screw up his plans, and unfortunately, there's not. Now, the good news is his monsters aren't going to be very apt or able to protect themselves. Uh, the bad news is that it probably doesn't matter. A couple of Colossi is going to look pretty good for our opponent, and enticing as well. But it's also going to look good for the individual with a super polymerization set. 
All right, they're going to go ahead and grab a copy of Thunder Dragon Fusion. This card feels really good when you're activating it normally, and slightly less good when it gets banished and isn't able to search on your next turn. They're going to hand the deck back to me. I'm sure they're going back in. Come on, don't play with my emotions like this. So, of course, Valkyries has a ton of attack. They're going to hard make a Titan, not using Fusion here, banishing a Thunder from hand in order to proc the effect. This is an interesting line and probably means they have at least one other extender in their hand, and there's the Hawk. This means they'll be able to make the Colossus Colossus Titan board, and we're just going to have to deal with it. So they're going to activate the effect of Titan as well, which is going to pop our Valkyris because they activated the effect of the Hawk in hand. I say, fine, I don't have a response to that. Afterwards, they're going to go ahead and banish the Dark in order to get themselves a copy of Thunder Dragon Colossus and banish this copy of Some Summer Summoner to do the same. A quick perusal of the hand reveals they don't have an OTK this turn outside of the monsters that are already on board, so there's no reason to commit to something like a Thunder Dragon duo into one singular set card. They'll send the Some Summer Summoner to the banished zone, fire off a Colossus, and go to the battle phase. I'm going to look real quick at the list of banished monsters and the singular monster in the graveyard. Ooh, it is a really good time to flip over Super Polymerization. I'm going to look real quick at the banished face-down cards. Hmm, okay, let's go ahead and fire it off. Or build suspense? What do you think? Will you die immediately here, or will you activate Super Polymerization? Ah, this is a classic MBT move. Alright, so we are going to activate the Super Polymerization. Uh, we're still under this idiotic shifter, so we're not going to be able to discard the Incantation Inception that would allow us to pop off next turn. Instead, we're going to eat both Colossi in order to get ourselves a copy of Starving Venom Fusion Dragon. Fusion Dragon's utility here is minimal. While it does gain a bunch of attack and outclass our opponent's Thunder Dragon, it doesn't exactly do what we want. See, we want this monster to be destroyed right now so that our opponent's Thunder Dragon Titan isn't long for this world. We know they have the Effect Veiler in hand, so if they're allowed to make it to our next turn, they can use the Effect Veiler on anything and protect their copy of Titan. Because unlike Colossus, Titan does not have a particular restriction as to what needs to be banished from the graveyard in order to keep it on field. Any two cards will do. And while they only have one right now, they are one Effect Veiler away from that protective status. Our opponent's going to read our card. Yes, it goes up to an obscene amount of attack points, but no, that doesn't particularly matter right now. They still have three cards in hand as well, one of which is Fusion, which will lead to an enormous pop-off post-turn. They think about activating it, but really there's no impetus to. What does it do? Get a second Titan? One Titan's enough, and you can protect it just fine. No reason to commit more to the board here. They're going to think real quickly, and then pass it back. Um, and we, we really gotta rip something insane right here. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay, so there's no Colossus at the very least, which means that we are going to be able to add cards from our deck to our hand. Trishula isn't great, but it's also not terrible. And we're gonna have to play through at least one copy of Effect Veiler. Yikes. There's a lot to keep track of. Our opponent's taking one final perusal of the extra deck, deciding if it's worth it to go into something else potentially off of this Thunder Dragon fusion. And I think eventually it's going to decide against it. No real reason not to just let me try and get in with this copy of Starving Venom Fusion Dragon. They'll look at the banished pile. Still has a lot of Thunder Dragons remaining in the deck, almost out of Hawks, but nothing else is particularly affected. Hmm. And all this said and done, they're going to take one final look and say, Well, um, alright, <laughs> do your worst. This is a deck that isn't playing particularly many hand traps. It hasn't interrupted my opponent yet. So it's very likely that my worst is enough to win the game. But there's still a game three after this, and no real reason to overextend, provided that we end up in it. So, go ahead.
The counter falls off our monster and we'll draw for turn. Oof. Does not look good from our perspective. Of course, we have Chalice Slime available this entire turn. Potentially, this is what we want to do. So, with an Incantation Inception in our graveyard, we'll activate the effect of Chalice Slime in order to summon an Incantation from our deck. Now we have the entire wealth of our deck at our disposal. Usually that manifests in a Talismandra, but we also could get a Candle here. Either way, we're going to have to find the material necessary to finagle a sweet Ritual Summon. So we're going to thumb through the deck real quickly. Again, this Choice Paralysis just coming in clutch and finally settling on a Talismandra whose effect will activate. Now our opponent's going to Effect Veiler here as expected, and uh, expecting it doesn't make it hurt any less. Okay, with the Talismandra negated, uh, we now are in a bit of a pickle. We sent the Inception to the graveyard for the activation of the Chalice Slime effect, so it's possible we might still be able to pop off, but quite unlikely. We're going to activate the Inception in Graveyard, destroying our copy of Incantation Talismandra to summon a different Ip from our deck. Now, there's not a lot of good ones at this point in the game. We haven't sent anything to the graveyard. All our important rituals and ritual spells are banished. So something like a pencil plume or a bookstone is going to do less than nothing in this particular scenario. I guess we could add back the Inception before the Inception is added back. That'd be a hilarious ruling nightmare. Maybe a judge call is our way out of this match. Eventually, though, we are going to read the writing on the wall and realize that the only important one we could get... Uh, is a candle. There's really no other option here. The other ones just don't fetch anything. We'll activate the effect of candle to get a ritual spell from our deck to our hand, but now we're sitting on two spells and a chalice line. That's not a great position to be in. Unfortunately, it also means that we're not going to be able to perform a ritual summon this turn, and we'll thus go down to 2,500 life points as a result of the chalice line. We'll add a Kaleidoscope to our hand. Kaleidoscope is pretty good, but only in a scenario where you have a Necroz to summon, and we don't. We'll look at the hand real quickly, and ugh, this is not good. Alright, well at the very least we'll make our opponent protect their monster. It's possible that there's a scenario in which they just don't, and that's our way to win this game. Uh, playing to your outs, I suppose, is important, especially in must-win game twos, but uh, they're going to real quick... Uh, look at their graveyard and decide, yeah, I actually don't need these two hand traps, I'm completely fine with saving the Titan. Ugh, there's not much I can do from this position besides take the 2500 and weep. So I think pretty likely I'm going to do that. Just a quick check to make sure all the doors are closed and there's no out for us. It's possible I could have played this set differently, but I don't know in what ways. Can smarter Necroz pilots than me let me know in the comments section below? I'm still trying to get a handle on what I should be doing with this deck, why and where. Eventually, all options gone, we'll pass it back to our opponent, who will look at their grip, activate a Thunder Dragon Fusion, and elicit a concession from us. A very unfortunate 2-0, but a lot of fun nonetheless. I look forward to getting better with this deck, and you'll be seeing a little bit more on camera as well. See you next time!